Hello, folks. I'm Lars Jorgensen. I've become interested in uh, Lifter about a year and a half ago, two years ago. It is a uh, not a profession for me, uh, but I think I've learned a fair amount, taught myself like a lot of the folks here. Um, in the environmental circles, you'll hear the reduce, reuse, recycle. So I'll try to turn that into a theme. Um, with using Lifter and particularly using the thorium uranium cycle, we naturally reduce the amount of plutonium produced in the first place by a factor of 12. Just without even working at it, that's just what will naturally happen because of the, the different fission nodes along the way and starting out further down the chain. Second, we can very reasonably reuse the existing light water reactor uh, transuranics and reduce the problems of the concerns over the actinide waste fairly dramatically, and I'll get more into that a little later. And then you can recycle the, the transuranics from the, that lifter itself produces back into it. But the gist of my talk is gonna be talking about the, the full cycle of what do we do when we finally come to the end and decide that fusion works and now we want to shut them down. That might be 20 years from now, it might be 200 years from now, it might be 2,000 years from now, depending on who you ask, but it's a fair question to ask, to say, is there a reasonable way to shut these down? So on the reduction side, a typical light water reactor will produce about 250 kilograms of plutonium plus itsy bitsy amounts of higher order ones, but mostly it's plutonium that they produce as waste. And if you've looked at this problem very much, you'll see that that is the waste that's of concern. It's that 250 kilograms. The fission products, we can be patient, we can put it into a man-made structure that lasts 500 years. We see lots of Roman structures that have lasted a lot longer than that. I can believe that we can engineer that. But the actinides that last tens of thousands of years it's a fair extrapolation from what we know what we're doing to say whether or not our engineered structures can last. We can put it into geological storage, and personally, I can believe that that works. And I'll believe a lot of the folks here do. But I don't think you can claim that we've succeeded in selling that to the public. So this is another avenue. If society wants to get rid of that stuff, we have a place to put it. We have a place that, that fits very comfortably into the molten salt reactors. One of the nice things about them is the very flexibility of being able to add a little bit of fizzle at a time. We're not very picky about what kind of fizzle it is. If it turns out it's got more 240 than 239 than we would planned on, it doesn't make much difference because it gets, as a fluid, it gets mixed in with everything else. Or if it's got more 239 than, two, than, than we planned on, it doesn't create a hot spot that's gonna melt in the middle of a solid fuel reactor. But this should be our first priority, not looking back at the waste we have, but rather getting the new generation of reactors that produce less in the first place. Because the amount of waste we've generated so far, if, you, if nuclear is gonna be successful the way we all think it's gonna be, is like 1% of how much is coming if we don't t uh, change the, the, the direction that just building more uh, light water reactors. So the priority should be first, let's get the new generation reactor started, because we know that's gonna take us time. And frankly, the, the existing light water reactor waste, it's not going anywhere. If we take 40 years before we get it into the, and start burning it, it, nothing has changed. Some pictures of the light water reactors um, waste. He asked me to hurry up, so I'm gonna, since I don't wanna talk too much about that, I'm gonna keep on going. Um, on recycling the transuranics from lifters, uh, there's been some statements saying we don't produce any. It's not precisely true. Uh, we produce about 20 kilograms of plutonium a year. Uh, oddly, it's plutonium-238 that we produce first, not 239, which has good news as far as proliferation worries go. It's not very easy to do anything with 238. Um, we might even be able to help NASA out a little bit with uh, some of the 238, although I think we'll produce much, much, much more than they could ever use. Uh, there are several different possibilities for how to get that plutonium out. That is an area that I would claim still is unsettled ground. That 
Um, we can do fluorination. Uh, ORNL did that. They managed to actually fluorinate out the plutonium. Um, and if you go through the numbers of what they achieved, it comes out to be about 99.8%, 99.7% for our scale of, of plutonium that, that we could get out if we got the same performance that they did. Um, but they preferred liquid metal exchange. Um, if you look at all their more recent stuff, they were always planning on that, uh, as are the French. Um, I just haven't seen the results, lab results that tells me that I'm encouraged by that pound. And then uh, IFR also had plans and they were talking about achieving 99.9. .9. So a variety of techniques are possible, but none of them are established. So we don't have any idea of the cost of any of them really. And it's a matter of society value. How important is it to us to take those 20 kilograms and get them out? One thing I'd like to point out though, is we focus a lot about the transuranics because when you're in the light water reactor cycle, the uraniums are all stable. 235, 236, 238, they're all very benign, not much different than 238. When we're on the thorium cycle though, we have um, 233 and 234. They're not quite so benign. In fact, it's fairly comparable to the plutoniums. So if you have a little itsy bitsy amount of 232 and it has a half-life very similar to plutonium-238. The 233, that's where the bulk of the fissile is going to be. And that has a longer half-life than plutonium, but it'll decay six times before it stabilizes. Whereas the plutonium, you take one decay node, and now you're in something that's stable for a fairly long time. So in terms of toxicity, it's pretty similar. And the uranium-234 is also um, similarly toxic to plutonium-240. So we have a fairly similar problem in terms of the uranium. One thing that's very fortunate is that the uranium is a lot easier to deal with chemically and extract from the reactors than the plutonium. So it's, it's, it's very reasonable to anticipate getting five nines of extraction for precision of taking the uranium out and keeping it out of the, the waste flow but we can't ignore the 233 and 234. And that particularly comes into play when you get into the inventory at shutdown. So we're doing fine during the normal operations and we're running our chemistry and we're putting the uranium back in, but when the day finally comes that we decide it's time to close this down, now you've got a reactor that's full of fizzle. It was ready to run. It's got tons inside of each of those reactors. Um, depending on what forecast you do, if you look and say, well, suppose we supplied the world's electricity demands with nuclear reactors of this style, you'd be needing on the order of 9,000 gigawatts worth of reactors. That's several tons each. That's a lot of actinides to take care of. The French Grenoble Group uh, had showed plans of how they could burn off a lot of that by coming up with a specialized reactor as you start burning off that stuff and just do that, you very rapidly build up the even order, higher order actinides and the kind of poisons the fuel. So they were able to reduce it by about a factor of 10 by doing specialized reactors to burn it off. But we need a much better game plan in my opinion than that. So that's what I'm gonna show you now. So suppose we start with 9,000 gigawatts worth of reactors and the order comes one day, shut them down. But we're gonna do this patiently and do it well. So what we'll do is we'll shut down 10% of them, take the core, transfer it over to the remaining 90%, and use that as the feed rather than feeding it thorium. It's all our lifters, you need to feed it fuel, which normally would be thorium. In this case, we're gonna feed it the, the core from the other reactors which is about 80 to 85% thorium, and the remainder is uranium, of so various flavors, most of it being 233, but every flavor in between. During this time, we're gonna be slightly overreactive. If we have a mind to, we can pump in some of the iodine-129 as the, the most desirable fission product to actually transmute. 
don't think there are any others that I would advocate transmuting, but if you want to transmute any of them, that's the one to do, because we have some extra reactivity during this time. As it burns that off, um, we can, when we burned off that core, we can say, okay, now let's shut down another 10%. And so what you'll get is exponentially decaying number of reactors going. So this is a graph showing um, if we start with, if we start with the transuranic inventory, start up a bunch of our reactors and mix it with a lot of 20% light, 20% uh, LEU to get them going. And we forecast ahead, we're thinking someplace south of 10,000 uh, tons of uh, transuranics is what we're expecting out of the light water reactors before we finally get to turn them off worldwide. So we put them all in to start it off, and when we first start it, we burn it off pretty rapidly in about 30, 40, 50 years, it's down to about half half that level. And then it stays there while we're burnt, while we're running our 9,000 plants. So we've, we've gone from roughly 500 plants to 9,000 plants, and we've taken the total worldwide existence of transuranics down by a factor of two. And we sit there and we operate that. In this case scenario, I had it operating for 200 years. So about year 200, I say, okay, the order came in to shut down. Um, after about 100 years, we've turned off 90% of the reactors. We still have a couple of thousand tons of uh, transuranics left to go. And then over the, the next 100 years, we can take it down. And this is on a linear scale, so you kind of lose track as we get too close to the zero there. Uh, but since we're engineers, at least many of us are, we can switch to a log scale. And then we can see what's going on as we go down there. So you can see the shutdown in about three, 400 years, you see we've gotten it down. We've burned up 90% of it. At this point, we're probably below what realistically we'll expect to have leaked during the 200 years of operation. That is, there's some transuranics that are gonna leak, we're not gonna be perfect in our chemistry. So if we get it down an order of magnitude below what leaked in the, during the operation, there isn't a lot of point to going further. But even if I take the extreme best case, which is to say, take the, the, the best claim I could find anywhere in literature, which was uh, five nines, and say, let's do it 10 times better than that. So this best case recycling is, is six nines. Not that I believe we can do that, but I believe that gives me a, a solid bound. I really doubt anybody's ever gonna do better than that. We can keep going. Gotta be very patient, six, 700 years, but we get there so that the inventory is not the problem. We can burn that off if we take the patience. Can I get to the conclusion? All right, let's work it. <laughs> okay. Um, last slide, it really was the last slide. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, you could take the problem of the transuranics and the actinides and change it from a 24,000 year half-life down to the equivalent of roughly a 30 year half-life. And then we can just go half-lives and half-lives until we've satisfied and we've gone far enough. This is done because we have a great deal of fuel flexibility with lifter. With the, with the liquid salts we can be, we have a lot of flexibility, we can adjust dynamically. It's not, because it's not solid fuel, we don't have to sweat the hot spots. And in the end, the inventory is not going to be our waste problem. We're going to be able to work our way past that. Thank you.